I just wanted to say that uh, this is, uh, in a sense, for investigative journalists, a rather a kind of a normal meeting, because the man who's sitting to my right uh, is probably the best known investigative reporter, certainly in the English language world, who's done more of what we think of as journalism, of proper journalism, than almost anybody we can think of. Uh, Seymour Hirsch, for uh, the few of you, and there may be only one or two of you who don't know some of this, but is responsible for my lie, the story of my lie, and the cover-up of my lie for an extraordinary history of Mr. Kissinger, uh, the dark Camelot <clears throat> book on the Kennedy family, which is in itself <clears throat> an extremely interesting book. I'd recommend it to anyone. Uh, he's also done probably the most important work on torture in current U.S. government practice in his work on Abu Ghraib. Uh, a story which I hope he'll tell us about in, in some detail because what's extraordinary about the Abu Ghraib story is that so many other people appeared to have parts of it or some of it and didn't publish it. It was, in fact, a movie was just made about the a kind of religious paean to Dan Rather, which was just made in which they, a woman comes rushing up to, to the main character playing Dan Rather and says, oh, I think... Seymour Hirsch has got this story first or something to this effect. So, and so this was the motivating factor in this scene. So I, but uh, most of you know, an overwhelming majority of you know who Seymour Hirsch is, and I'll introduce Seymour Hirsch. All right. <laughs> well, gonna have, since I, I, I told Gavin it probably made sense for him to ask me some questions that are more locally relevant because uh, I just have my own um, pro uh, or objective view of America. We are a very exceptional country. We're going to see Hillary versus uh, Trump. That's exceptionalism. <laughs> 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 but I'll tell you, the whole purpose of journalism, the way I look at it is, is um, um, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, there's a narrative and there's a counter narrative. And so I always think about the counter narrative. In this election, I would say one of the counter narratives, of course, Sanders is a counter narrative, but not only because he's coming from the point of view that the system is so corrupt, and what he's talking about is we're actually seeing played out. I, I, some of you probably know if you check the email, there was a riot last night where Trump finally spoke in the north in, in Illinois, and of course, a couple of thousand people rioted there, and they had to shut down the speech, uh, which is going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't know where America's going to go, but it's, he's describing a real situation. There's a polarization in America that's, that's unavoidable at this point between, uh, if you will, the Christian right or the right and the rest of us. Um, for me, the interesting thing about Sanders, of course, just in terms of how do you think about a story like this, um, I think about it this way. Um, although Sanders is Jewish, he's very, very open-minded about the need for... Um, um, uh, for the rights of the Palestinians, very sensitive to the way the Israelis treat them, the uh, Palestinian community, and that, that 50 or 60 years of grinding their nose in terms of humility into the dust. And so for me, the Sanders thing is this. The first time in my lifetime, I actually am seeing a Democrat running for the presidency who doesn't have to go to the Jewish community in New York for money. That offers incredible possibilities. <laughs> It's just so interesting to me, but of course for the media it's a non-entity. So it's always finding things, um, um, it's always looking at things from a different point of view. And uh, he mentioned Abu Ghraib, I knew about Abu Ghraib for, mm, let's see, uh, five and a half months before I could finally get enough to write about it. In America, you can, it's very hard, um, you have to have what made Snowden work so well, although, uh, I, 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 please don't, don't, don't I'm not suggesting uh, uh, anything but great things about what he did, in the, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but a lot of us knew that every, we were being watched. We knew that metadata was going on. We didn't know how bad it was, and we knew it was extensive. I, I was told right after 9-11, I, I haven't put any interview notes in, in my computer ever since. I was told by somebody not to do it in October of uh, a month after 9-11, so I knew then something was up. Uh, although it was hard to figure it all out. Uh, but if you think about Snowden, here's what you think about. When people talk about paranoia, 
So let's see. The NSA, uh, I did a story about the NSA in 1999 for The New Yorker. And by the way, um, you're talking to somebody, as you heard all those wonderful things about what a, you know, what a good career I had. I've worked at three places in my career, the AP, uh, Associated Press, um, the New York Times for many years, talk about establishment press, and at the New Yorker. And each place I've left, and everybody cheered. So happy to get rid of me. <laughs> Nobody said, oh, please, nobody said, oh, please, come back. No. <laughs> so I understand the limits to the game. <laughs> the thing that's interesting about, um, the thing that's interesting about this, uh, the same in Abu Ghraib, the same idea that you know something and how can you get it out? What do you need to do to get it out, get it into the mainstream? It's very hard. Documents are important. And Snowden is important because he, he released documents. And that's what makes Julian so important. Um, I use his stuff. I'm sure many of you know what I'm talking about. There's great indexes. You can write, I, just, um, I was just writing something about um, Syria. We can talk about that in a minute. Um, and there's so much stuff there. Even the ones, even if it's not highly classified, historians are going to have an incredibly good time with, the, uh, with, the, with the, the, the half a million various documents or more he's put out. In any case, about Snowden, the way I look at the Snowden story is I say, okay, Let's see. We now know, I started to tell you that in 1999, I spent time writing about the NSA because I knew how it was just sort of comically. A, a friend of mine in the CIA once asked somebody in the late 90s, this is when, when fiber optics were beginning to get going, and the NSA was really blind for a long time. I, I, have, a friend in the, I have a friend in the CIA, he's one of these extremely conservative but totally honest guys. And, um, uh, I once, after 9-11, this is a digression, remind me, somebody keep track of where I am, so I get back to it. <laughs> but I did, I was just thinking about him. Uh, I asked him once, after 9-11, I, I know before 9-11, nobody, nobody shared anything in the community. The NSA kept the stuff, the CIA kept the stuff, the FBI did. And it was some months after, there was some, oh, without getting into, I, I'm, I'm still writing stuff about the post 9-11 period. Uh, but, I had written for the New York Times uh, a, a, a long article about, um, about domestic spying. And son of a bitch, but after 9-11, the CIA was back spying again inside America without telling the FBI. And uh, of course, and there were some events that I, was, I know about. And I, I went to one of my friends, this particular friend in, in the uh, CIA, and I said, I really was mad at him. I said, geez, you know, 9-11, you know, that's sort of a traumatic event for us. Um, and in real time, it was. Uh, we were very vulnerable to this attack, obviously. And why were we so vulnerable? One of the reasons we were so vulnerable is everybody collected, nobody shared. And I, after so a few months after 9/11, we had some drinks, and I said to them, "You know, what is wrong with you guys in the CIA? What the hell is wrong with you? What kind of crazy people are you? You don't share anything, even now." And he looked at me and he said. Hey, Cy, this is, and I'd been doing stuff on the intelligence community for a long time, it was never put quite as clearly. He says, don't you get it? He said, the FBI catches bank robbers and we rob banks. <laughs> what do you think we do? And so every time I see the CIA, just the other day they put out, I, I did stuff on bin Laden challenging the official rule, rule, view, and the other day they called in reporters by name to a briefing, unnamed CIA official. The CIA has now become, it, I probably always has, but it's more clear now than ever. It's a, just a, another political office of the White House. There's no objectivity disappeared. But anyway, they called him in and they released, uh, they released a, a series of bin Laden letters that were very interesting, saying how we're great friends, uh, we Sunnis with the Shia in uh, Iran, et cetera, et cetera, all these crazy things. And uh, they released all these letters that they, they claimed that the American SEALs who killed him, murdered him, because that's what it was, um, uh, collected. And, uh, and of course, the people there, nobody would ask this question. Let's see, no, it's very clear he was handwriting these stuff. They had said that. There was a handwritten letters. And nobody said, well, wait a second. Is there is a South Asian tradition to always keep a second copy of every letter you write? How do they get letters you're sending to other people? I mean, it's obvious that it's all, you know, the line that goes on is breathtaking. And the naivety of the press remains breathtaking. To get back to um, um, uh, uh, the Abu Ghraib, well, about Snowden. Here's the thing that you, for me, that you, you have to know about Snowden. 
Um, uh, I had written about the, the, the incompetence of the CIA, of the NSA, uh, the inability in the late 90s to do much with fiber optics initially. They, they, they fixed it. And, um, uh, and I, I, I'd gotten to it because a friend of mine, I once asked a friend, who was a station chief in, in the Middle East, what's the one thing he wanted the most? He said, oh my God, I wanted Ahmed with a good backhoe. I want him. And I said, what? What do you mean with a good backhoe? He said, I want somebody to go out and dig up, a, dig up and find every, every fiber optic cable and bust it. So they have to go back to communicating in the ether so we can collect it because we're not very good at that. So, you know, so... Um, you learn there were problems. So I wrote a story in which I interviewed the head of the NSA. His name is Mike Hayden. He just wrote a book, and he later became head of the CIA. And the last paragraph was about him saying, uh, I asked him if he would ever spy on Americans because there was always that notion that there's a lot of lying that goes on in the FISA process. The, as you know, there's a, a court in which you're supposed to get a warrant, and everybody wants to think that it's the problem with the court is the judges are all Republicans. But the, the fact is many of the Republicans are libertarians that care more about the Constitution than most. The fact is that the NSA, is, is, take my word for it, has been cheating. It listens before it gets a warrant to make sure the warrant's going to be approved. Uh, that happens a lot more than anybody knows. Anyway, but the, 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 um, so here's this guy who tells me we're never going to spy. And he's spying on everybody. And here's this NSA. You, you saw Bill Binney, and you saw Tom Drake, who's here today. You saw the, the sort of incredible integrity they have in terms of knowing the power they have to violate the constitutional rights and the care that the NSA, and even in the CIA, the good people were very careful. They, they, a lot of them did not want to go over the line. And so you have a situation where after 9-11, it's very clear, and if you read Bill Binney's stuff, and you should, his, his long essays and, and articles, the history of what happened to Binney and Weeby and the, all these guys, Loom, all the guys that were sort of, that collectively objected to the, the immediate disavowal of everything the NSA was saying publicly about not violating the rights, the, 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 the Fourth Amendment rights, the rights to, um, and the Fifth Amendment, really, too. Um, of, 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 uh, of Americans, not uh, eavesdropping on everybody. Um, and so that was all thrown away. And so you had a situation where there's, what, about, I don't know how many, 25, 30,000 workers. I don't know how many there were in 2001, but it's now close to 30,000. And you certainly have that many contractors. But let's say, let's go down. Let's say there's 20,000 people at the NSA and 20,000 contractors, most of whom have all the clearances. It's really sort of like, in, once you leave the NSA, if you play the game and form a corp company, and you know, you heard, some, this was mentioned yesterday, you can, you can, as, as uh, Tom said yesterday, you could be making a great deal of money. It's sort of like, it's sort of like a, a, a Franklin Delano Roosevelt had all these worker groups that, you know, all these uh, um, projects, these, uh, uh, the, the, what we would call socialism, <laughs> the Sanders idea of, of putting a lot of people to work. Um, and um, uh, the NSA is sort of like that. It's sort of like a post-depression um, uh, day uh, employment agency. You can go, just go to work and get contracts. I mean, that's what it is. I mean, you go to work and you get a contract and you hire some people and you, you're, you're dipping in. And, um, and so, let's say 20,000 people, let's say 10% of them, 2,000, knew within days because the word was out very quickly on the inside that everything's, it's all over. We're, we're listening to everybody. We're opening up everything. It's going to be metadata. The Brits are very good because they, they don't use metadata. And what, what Binney was doing was trying, his group was trying to do the same sort of small scale, carefully vetted uh, listening uh, with warrants and with the proper procedure, but instead of the broad scale stuff, everybody knew it. And then you have contractor world, 10%, that's 4,000 people within, let's say within two, three months after the decision was made to start listening or listening. Uh, it's probably a lot more than that, but let's say 4,000 people. And out of this, um, um, but when did Snowden go public? Two, three years ago? Was it three years ago already? Was 2013, it 13? 13. Yeah. So out of this, um, this begins in 2001, 12, 13 years later, one guy goes public. One guy and tells it. And then what happens? Nobody else says anything. And people say to me, you can't have, it's paranoia to talk about conspiracies. And when you think about a conspiracy, 
there was this, at least 4,000, and I'm sure the number is a magnitude bit more, a significant percentage of the NSA, I've talked to a lot of people who have told me with great reluctance, but they, they're truth tellers when they retire. Of course we knew what was going on. The word was out right away. I mean, how could you not know? Um, a, nobody told us anything for 13 years till Snowden did it, and then nobody said a word in his defense afterwards. It's pretty amazing. So, you know, when people say, some of the people who, you know, we're in La La Land, when we start talking about the capability of the government to do things uh, that are against our, the, the citizens' interests, um, and, that, um, uh, and that once you're inside, it's very insular. I mean, and I see it more and more in the press. I think the American press, even the, particularly in the Main Street, uh, I worked at the New York Times, and I, I always never felt a constraint. Um, we had a very, <laughs> a very conservative editor, uh, Abe Rosenthal, who was, uh, he later went on to write insanely conservative right uh, columns. But uh, when I worked there, he would, you know, I joke all the time, he used to come to the Washington News Bureau and, or, and come up and pat me on my head. How's my little commie today, he would say. <laughs> and then, and then the, the, next, the next question was, what do you have for me? It's the, it's the next question that doesn't, doesn't get asked anymore in the, in the press. So when you see the shift to the right, <laughs> uh, you just see it. It's right there. It's just right there. It's right there for all of us. And we, we have... Uh, I'll describe the situation in Syria the way I like to describe it. Right now what's going on in Syria basically is the United States and Russia and the Syrian army and the Iranian army and Hezbollah are fighting a war against the NATO ally, Turkey. That's what the situation is. We're basically in a war with the Kurds on our side. So we're basically at war with, with, with uh, the, the, the government of Turkey, and particularly its crazy president, who's, who basically wants to reestablish the Ottoman Empire, you know, uh, of the uh, 17th and 18th century. I think that's his dream. Who knows what his dream is? But it's something. And so we're basically in a war against the NATO. It's really quite amazing. But it's never described that way. And we have, as much as I think Obama's done some things that are useful domestically, and I sort of, there's a lot of things about him, uh, just in terms of sheer brain power, for once, that's, that's good to have a president who's pretty smart. He's just, this, on foreign policy, it's incapable of telling the truth to the American people. Just incapable. And so, you know, there we are. Let's do questions. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, Let, hold well here's the point. Yeah. Here's the point. The point is, the point is that the world is increasingly, as you see in the Trump, and I, even in the Hillary crowd, you know, don't forget what she said about Gaddafi. We came, we saw, he died. That's the line she did say about him, this insane operation that took place, what, four years ago, five years ago in Libya. Um, the, the point is, uh, uh, the point is that the world's increasingly being run by despots and people without character or not as much character as they could have or should have. And so what I see, what we do in the media, whatever, wherever you are, and, and that's why this whole notion of this internet and this whole new sort of emerging inchoate, far from perfect, new wave of journalism that's gonna soon take over because I think the, print, print, the printing press is in trouble. Uh, this whole new wave of communication um, um, uh, uh, it's, it's the job we have, and the way I like to see what we do is, it's sort of our job to be uh, at least a filter or a moderator or a medium through which we can do something about the madness and the craziness of the people that lead the world. And we find it more and more, you know, criminals, um, uh, despots, uh, people who um, uh, uh, personalize everything are leading the world. And so this, the, the filter is us, and that's why it's so important to be in opposition and to have counter-narrative, because it, it, certainly in my country, I, I think uh, uh, the, with, the, with the, the dumbing down of Congress because of the, 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 the money, the corruption of the money, you can't run for Congress unless you have a PAC and you have all this money that Sanders is talking about. Sanders is really a, an amazing sort of phenomenon and that the American press just ignores pretty much. They cover him, but it's always an anomaly when he does well. There's something going on there's something really going on in America, and it's not going to die whether he wins or loses. It's not going to die whether Hillary wins or loses. It's not going to die. There's something going on, and it's pro who knows where it's going to end up. It could end up in violence, as we saw in Chicago yesterday. It could end up in violence. We're on that edge. So America's in a very interesting place right now, and you're not hearing about it. 
You're not hearing about it. There's something that makes the 30-year-olds go 80% for him. And it, it includes among the uh, urban blacks, too. Uh, they're going very strong for him. Not in the South, but other places. It's just a fascinating time about what you're not being told enough about because it's too counter-narrative. We're still focused on, you know, what will Trump or Rubio say? <laughs> you know, and there we are. It's just like, what? What? What does that have to do with what's really going on? There's something really going on here that they're not seeing. They don't want to see because it's against the interest. I don't know. I don't know for what reason. You know, but, but it's there, there are other things that you've dealt with which also deal with omission. I mean, you think, for example, of Abu Ghraib. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, perhaps you could tell us a bit about the experience of having that story you said for months in advance. Well, you, you mentioned that TV show. What I had yeah, it, yeah. it I, I knew about it because I, I spent time in... Um, uh, in Damascus in, in December of, um, over Christmas, I think, of uh, uh, 2003, what we did is uh, after, we, after, what, after the America won the war against the, um, um, uh, against the, 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 uh, uh, the army that didn't fight and went to fight another day, I mean, we, that's another history we don't look at of why the insurgency began is because they chose to do what what happens in Afghanistan with the Brits, if you know that history. The invaders come and everybody moves away and then eventually the war comes. In fact, I went, it's a digression, but when I went, um, uh, we, the war, the, 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 the Iraqi army collapsed completely. Uh, and it did collapse. It just, many elements moved to the underground to begin what they, uh, we were not subtle about what we were going to do. And there was a lot of planning. You're not going to stand up and fight us man to man. It wouldn't, it wouldn't work. We have too much power. So they go and they began the insurgency. Um, uh, um, Donald Rumsfeld, the Secretary of State, when they first began to get attacks on our troops, he called them dead enders, not understanding what was going on. Um, and um, uh, there was a real insurgency that went on. And um, uh, 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 I'm one of those people who think that um, we had... We really, in America, we have a moral obligation to do more than we did for the people of I Iraq. We, not just pulling out just isn't, wasn't the answer. We really owe the people of Iraq a life. And, um, you know, I, I wonder what a five-year-old kid in 2003, you know, 13 years later, 16 years old, if, if he's not psychotic, there's something wrong with him because it's, we've left a psychotic world there. Anyway, um, so... The, after the war, we immediately, the first thing we did was um, Mossad went after the Makabarat, <laughs> killed everybody who was in the, in the Israeli section. We went after everybody. We set up, we turned some of the people around in the Makabarat in, in their killing teams. We began assassination squads through third parties, the El Salvador model. And, um, um, uh, and so, uh, um, it, <laughs> Whatever happened there is, is so completely unreported. It's sad, but anyway, we went to almost everybody a one and two star in the, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, whether you're Sunni or Shia in the, in the Iraqi army, we grabbed. We either killed them or we had people kill them or we turned them around. Uh, we neutralized them and there was one guy we missed. It was an, uh, a signals intelligence officer, Air Force. Very articulate, very good English. Uh, he worked with the UN crowd. That's how I knew him through some of the UN peacekeeping crowd. And uh, he had a, he was in Baghdad. He had an 18-year-old daughter that was in med school, and she didn't know English, so she could, they had to stay. There was a med school there in Baghdad, and a younger boy. And he stayed. Uh, he left eventually, but he stayed as long as he could. But he came out to Damascus. I remember it cost a lot of money for him to take a taxi to get through the lines. You could do it even then in December of 2003, that's was what, what, eight months or nine months after the American invasion. And um, uh, he spent five days with me in a hotel uh, telling me everything he could, including what he said was, he said, you've got to watch Abu Ghraib, he said, because the woman there, uh, I'll never forget this, he said, the women who are there are writing, when they, when they see family or somebody leaves, they're passing the word, uh, you know about the notion of the sacredness of woman there in terms of men, and very pristine, um, um, uh, different culture. If, if I play tennis with somebody in Cairo, we don't shower together. Everybody showers privately. It's a different culture. Um, and um, 
uh, we work on guilt, you could say, in the West, and they work on shame. <laughs> Maybe it's very simplified, but there's, there's a lot, of, lot to it. Anyway, um, he said that the women there, the wives and, and women and daughters who are in jail, there were many in jail, are writing letters and telling their brothers and father to come and kill them because they've been dishonored by the Americans in the jail. So, wow, I mean, wow, that's, that's another level of, of corruption, that, all of which we don't know much about. But anyway, that got me into it. And then I could pick up stuff. And eventually, the, the, what happened with CBS was um, I had picked up on the photographs that were around and also on this wonderful man named Tony, Anto uh, Army Major General named Anthony Taguba, who was born in the Philippines and uh, was the highest ranking a member of, uh, he, his father was, had, would been the Philippine Army and was in, and had saved American lives. And they, they, after the war, he became an American Army uh, sergeant. And he raised his sons very rigorously. He, had, um, he, went, he went to a scholarship in, in, in Idaho, Boise State University, graduated uh, what we call ROTC, obligated to the military, Tony. He was five foot three and 120 pounds, and he got to be a two-star. And by the time he was an, assigned to investigate the Abu Ghraib event, he was going to have a third star. There was nobody that high up in a minority, uh, uh, in an Asian minority or a Filipino ma majority ever in the army. So, um, and um, uh, uh, he had done a report that I got my hands on. So from my point of view, um, this was at the New Yorker, uh, the report was devastating. It, and uh, he later told me that when he was writing that report, the commanding general of the, uh, of the war, a general named Abizade, they, we, our headquarters was in Doha, um, outside of Doha. They were, he was with his boss, and the report was pretty much done, and the boss had knew about it, and one day they were in a car together, and the boss had the, there was a driver, and he rolled up the window between the driver and uh, he and Tony, and he said to Tony, he said, you know, Tony, if you do that report the way it's going to be, the way you've written it, he said, you will be investigated. You're, you're going to be in real trouble. And as he told me, he said, I'd been in the Army 31 years, and it was the first time I thought, oh, my God, I may be in the mafia. It's an amazing line. And so you have that sort of integrity that does exist. And, you, uh, and I, wanted, I heard CBS had the photographs, and they were afraid to run them. And so what I did was, and I wanted CBS, even though my editor disagreed violent with me, he was, I said, no. I said, no, let them run the photographs first on television, and then we'll run the report. And the report, it's so much, it's, it's uh, 60 pages of complete criminality from top to bottom. It's devastating. It's, it, it, it's, it'll change. And, and so he agreed. And uh, uh, week after week, CBS didn't run it. And I knew they were ready to run. I knew somebody there at 60 Minutes. And I knew that the bosses were telling Dan Rather and those people no. So I actually did. I just did call up and say to somebody at CBS high up, <laughs> I did say, that's why it's in that movie, I did say, here's the situation. You guys have now run, had the story ready to go for two weeks. They were on then on Thursdays and Sundays, 60 Minutes. It was the only serious news show, even though it's less serious than it was in America. There's no news in America at all. No news. You just, it's just hopeless. Hopeless. It's just hopeless. It's just, it's just maddening. Thank God for sports. I like TV. And so anyway, um, um, and I did say, uh, I said, here's the story. If you don't run it the next show, I'm doing this story. You know what I have. They all knew I had this. I have a report you don't have. And the second paragraph of my story is going to describe in detail how for three weeks you hesitated not to run the story. So they ran it. And the thing, <laughs> the thing, well, the thing that nobody wrote about is they began, rather began, they, he began, he said, CBS is running this show only because we know another major news organization is preparing to publish it. And so, therefore, we feel we have to do it as a matter of comp That's how they began their show, <laughs> excusing themselves for running it. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. That's the way they did it, passed unnoticed. I just thought to myself, wow, they acknowledge what cowards they are. So anyway. <laughs> so there we are. Okay. We're stuck with um, television. Let's see. My colleagues go on television daily, hourly, on the cable news shows about politics and events. No, no, there's no more any foreign policy. Syria's off the wall, or Russia's off the wall, even though we, we all want to hate Putin. But other than that, the world just, anything else is off the wall. There was an election 
in Iran that turned out not the way they wanted it, and then moderates won. Now, that's a non story. You know, it's much better if the, if the right wing had won. And now we're going after them because they fired some missiles that if they had a nuclear bomb, why, may, there might be a violation. But since they don't have, anyway, there's, they have a legal right to do. Uh, the Iranians have never cheated. They've been under, the, under you know, I'm a, you all know the story. Iranians have, the International Atomic Energy Agency has been monitoring the Iranians from day one. They issue four reports a year, and every year they say no sign of any diversion. They're enriching to about 3.7, enough to run a reactor a commercial reactor for power. Guess what? In the summer, Tehran has brownouts. Four hours on, four hours off. They need a lot more juice. Uh, they do have a lot of oil and gas, but they don't have a line running from the southern port where they ship it up north. They, they stupidly don't really get, they, they export too much of their stuff. Uh, they don't use enough of it domestically, their gas anyway. And so they, they have a power problem. Um, not unknown. Everybody, any, anybody who knows anything about the country knows it, but you know, these are all facts not to be told. So anyway, um, uh, it's just a sitter. These stories are just sitters. But you know, in the case of um, what happened is, I knew about Abu Ghraib. It maybe led me to keep on asking and get a piece of paper, but you did need a piece of paper. In America, you need a piece of paper. Snowden provided the pieces of paper. And there's a lot more where there is. I don't know why we don't see it all, but that's okay. We've done, he's certainly done enough. Uh, Der Spiegel has much more. I don't know why Der Spiegel doesn't do more, but that's their business. You know, I mean, uh, Spiegel's on fine on that one. I got no problem with Spiegel. Let's go do some questions. No, I think, I think we're, in fact, we've got a terrible problem because we're now out of time. Well, you should do one question one to make question. everybody late. All right, okay, one question. There's a lady here. Right, okay. Oh. I'm around. I'm, 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 yeah, there's some, yeah, there's a question to here. To there's some people want to talk to me, and I, I didn't yeah. answer them, but I'll be around afterwards. We can go do one some interviews here. later. Okay. Go ahead, yes, go ahead. All right, hello, thank you very much. I'm very flattered, I'm the only question. Um, I was wondering, you, uh, you mentioned, I guess it's, it's, it's all linked, you were, you were talking about what, what Der Spiegel is doing with what they have, you were talking about how there's this shift of the, um, of the media to the right, you were, you were talking how to bring a story uh, to people, and I was wondering, do you think it's getting more and more difficult? Because uh, I'm a journalist, I did a lot of interviews with former uh, state officials, uh, especially American ones, and it seemed that it seems that everyone was telling me that right now it's becoming more and more difficult to bring about a different narrative from the all consensual narrative uh, in the U.S., for example. I probably think it is getting more and more the same in, in Europe, but since you know the U.S. much better than I do, I wanted to ask you what you think about this. Is it really more difficult these days to? to bring a different narrative, to, uh, to break out a story which I got would go it. against I got the it. men. Okay. Yeah, thank okay. you. The way I, my answer to that is boo-hoo. <laughs> <laughs> it's never been easy. Uh -huh. You okay. know, is it more difficult, less difficult? Boo-hoo. That's your job, not to worry about it. <laughs> go get it. Okay. Okay. Thanks, I. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Long way to go. <laughs> right. Ha, <laughs>